Welcome, and thank you for joining today's conference, National Veterinary Stockpile Resource Request Process. Before we begin, please ensure that you have opened the chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, enter your question in the message box provided, and send. To minimize the background noise on this call, please ensure that your audio device is muted. With that, I'll turn over the call to Elizabeth Fernandez. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I'm Liz Fernandez with the Professional Development Services Branch, and I'd also like to welcome you to today's webinar. Our presenter today is Lisa Brown. Lisa is the National Veterinary Stockpile Logistics Chief responsible for managing and overseeing the functions associated with supply planning, procurement, contract oversight, storage, transportation, and distribution for the APHIS Veterinary Services Warehouse and the National Veterinary Stockpile Resources for logistics, operations, and sustainment during an emergency event in accordance with Homeland Security Presidential Directive 9. Ms. Brown received a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration from Grantham University and a Master's of Business Administration with a focus in marketing and supply chain management from Ashford University. Ms. Brown is a retired U.S. Army Gulf War veteran with 22 years of active duty military service. And with that, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Lisa. Thank you, Liz. Good morning, everybody, and thank you all for um, participating today um, in our webinar. So today, we're going to talk about the National Veterinary Stockpile Resource Request, request Process. So we're going to go ahead and get started, and I'm advancing to slide two. So the purpose of the webinar is to familiarize people with requesting National Veterinary Stockpiles. What we use to request those items is the ICS-213RR, and we also want to talk about a little bit today about the statement of work that is um, used during an emergency response for requesting 3D response support services. Okay, before I get into the ICS-213, I just want to highlight really quickly um, the, re the, the process for requesting and deploying an NDS asset. Um, many people have seen this process, but it's how we're activated, so I figured I would just go over it very quickly um, before we get into the 213s. So at the onset of a response, the state animal health, health official and that area veterinarian in charge will determine that all of their resources in the state will soon be exhausted. And in that, and, and in that moment, they need the MVS assistance, so they will use the five-step process listed on this slide that shows what will happen next. So the first thing that occurs is the state animal health official and the area veterinarian in charge will agree MVS support is needed. They will consult with the VS district office, and the VS district office will call the PSYOPS 24-hour hotline. Once that call is placed, the NVS director, Mr. Rodney White, will receive a call from that emergency hotline, and he will return that call to acknowledge the request from the state animal health official, the ABIC, as well as the, district, the VS district office and he will initiate a conference call with all parties. A conference call is set up, all the parties are on that call, and the issues surrounding this particular response is discussed. And at that point, APHIS will approve the ICS-213, and the National Veterinary Stockpile Deployment Management Team will coordinate deployment details with the Incident Command POC. That incident command POC at that point is usually the logistics chief. And then, of course, the NVS will deploy the countermeasures within 24 hours um, after APHIS approves it. So that's how we're activated. Now we're activated and we're ready to start submitting resource requests and receiving them. So our next slide we're going to cover is requesting NVS supplies and equipment using the 213RR. I put some pictures of some of the items that are currently being requested um, with, you know, the swine um, issue with COVID-19. Um, and then, of course, some just some of our regular items that we have in our 
soft towel. So when you get ready to submit your request for your um, supply or equipment, there's two things that you need. And those two things are the ICS 213RR form, and then you, of course, need the National Veterinary um, um, Stockpile because that's going to stockpile catalog because that's what's going to tell you what's available, and you can browse through there and look through it to get the proper information in order to prepare your 213. Okay, advancing forward. So the National Veterinary Stockpile, as I said, it contains supplies, equipment, it describes contents, um, uh, contents of pushback modules. It has your personal protective equipment, the contamination supplies. It will have respirators, all of the types of respirators that are stocked, um, vaccine and ancillary supplies. It will have the animal handling equipment as well as any depopulation equipment that we stock, our cold chain packaging supplies, carcass disposal supplies, and communication um, equipment that we have available. Okay, so now that we have looked through the catalog, we kind of have an ideal of what we need. Um, so now we need to determine what other information do I need to complete this request. So I always say let's look at the who, what, when, where, and why. So who prepares the ICS-213? Um, is it going to be your, if you're mobilized in an incident command structure, will it be your logs IMT or deputy logs? Or will you designate that out to some other team member, maybe supply unit leader? Um, then if it's not an incident, incident management team structure as we're kind of operating today, um, are you setting up another type of response activity and you assign people responsibilities for submitting the ICS-213? That is the person that would prepare the 213. So now that we've established who the prepar who's the preparer, now that person needs to know what is required. So what supplies or equipment is needed? Right now, masks are the big thing. So we're going to use that as an example. We need paper masks. When do you need it? What is your required delivery date? Well, our process basically is that we ship within 24 hours. So if you don't know what your required delivery date is and you leave it blank, it's okay. We, um, we will receive that, that order and we will process it and ship it the same day for next day delivery. So that, that isn't too much of an, an, an issue when, when you're trying to determine the need. But you need to know where you're shipping it to. What is your delivery address? Who is the point of contact for receiving that? That's critical information so that we can get the item to the proper person. And why do you need it? Are we in a response? Are we in COVID-19 response? Are we in D&D response? Or are we in some other type of response? Then you would list the response name. Is it urgent or routine? Everything's urgent. We ship everything within 24 hours. A lot of people will leave that blank. Um, so just know, as stated earlier, we ship same day, next day delivery. So it, it's always going to be treated as an urgent shipment for us. Now you need to know, what are your limitations that can impair movement of offloading at delivery? Um, you maybe are going to receive a pallet of items, and maybe you don't have a dock, and maybe you don't have a forklift to unload that pallet. Um, thus the information that you need to relate to us in your request I have no forklift, we don't have a dock. Um, that way when we make the transportation arrangements, we can make arrangements maybe to get a truck, you know, that has a lift gate, or maybe we can package it differently so that it is in multiple shipments where it can be just removed from the truck without, you know, making it difficult to receive those items from the, from the truck into the warehouse. And one of the most important things is the funding code. Who's going to provide it? In an incident command structure, the finance IMT will provide that fund code. Sometimes that's designated down to the logistics chief, the person who may be submitting the request. But in all cases, the MBS already has the fund code. So if it isn't provided, um, we, we will have it, but we, we really would like 
if the fund code is available for it to be placed on the 213. That way we don't have to go in and modify and place that in there ourselves. And the last thing, where, does, where do I submit that ICS 213 form? You submit it to the NBS at USDA.gov mailbox. Now, with this being said, this is using the 213 in the manual process like we are currently using right now. But there's also the EMERS process um, where um, 213s are, are submitted by the incident management team and it does not go into the MBS mailbox, it's actually in EMERS. So um, I just wanted to caveat that just so people know the manual way that we're doing it will go to, to the MBS mailbox, but in EMERS, it's within EMERS, we all work within EMERS, um, so we would not have to um, have anything mailed to the MBS mailbox for an EMERS ICS 213. Okay, I'm gonna move along to the next slide. Okay, so for purposes of demonstrating some of the ICS 213s, I've selected today to do a couple of different versions of the 213 form using current events that's ongoing. So this first one I would like to show is a COVID ICS 213 RR form. I have modified this form for PII information, um, um, removing names and addresses um, because we're not allowed anymore in shipping to include personal identifiable information in documents that may end up on the internet. So, um, um, so you'll see where I wrote in things. So this particular ICS 213RR um, came from District 1 and it was filled out um, very well. And um, the first thing you're gonna look at is number one where it states, it states incident name. So for this particular incident name, it was called COVID-19 phase one reopening. And then they selected the date of June 5th in block two. And of course the resource request number is COVID-19 D1-P1 for phase one. They entered their quantity under block four in the quantity field of 120. They provided their nomenclature, which is a midline EN14683 latex face, um, free face mask. They entered their stock number, which is an MBS stock number. And you will know that because MBS is in, is listed in, is embedded in the stock number. And then they gave a description of what it was. It's a paper mask. They, they stated what it was for, VS New Jersey phase one, and the date that they requested it. Now, in this line, you can also put your estimated date, which for us would be the date that you expect to, to receive it. But as stated earlier, a lot of times, a date is not placed in there um, because we basically will do next day shipping. So you go down to block five, and this is where you're gonna put really the most important information needed in the 213. You're gonna put the shipment address of where this item is being shipped to. For purposes of this 213, I edited it out and put X's in the address. Um, and um, that would be a New Jersey shipment um, that would be shipped out. The name of the person submitting the order or the person that we're marking that order for. So let's just say it was marked for Lisa Brown. My name would be there. I would be the person that would receive this at the address listed above. Um, we're asking that you, um, you give us an email for us to send you status on your shipments. So that is email a person submitting order at usda.gov and the phone number of that person. We asked if there were any limitations on it, or that would impair movement or offloading. It was non-applicable, so there's no issues with receiving 120 masks. And um, um, the last line item on there is, it's a secondary point of contact. So if you're at, you're the logs chief at an IMT, for example, and maybe you're not gonna be there to receive that shipment, your deputy log might be listed there, or your supply unit leader might be listed there. So provide a secondary name of a person if you wanna make sure that that shipment is received by one or two and it's not just left with anyone um, when it arrives. 
Okay. So I'm going to move on to the last or next to the last page of this. So here we would put our primary point of contact and secondary point of contact name and information. In most cases, this is not filled out unless it's used for response purposes, um, but sometimes people do put it in there. So what you would have is your name, your phone number, your cell phone number, and of course your email. Block six through 12 is mainly used for IMTs, and that they will provide district information, um, emergency description of information, um, log order numbers, and of course, um, supplier points of contact if applicable, that would be us. But the one thing everybody has to submit um, is number eight. They have to let us know whether or not it's urgent or routine. And in this case, this one is checked as a routine shipment, but as stated, all items are shipped with next day delivery anyway. And the last page of the 213, it just has block 13. If we were shipping some antiviral med medication, we would be asking for a medically qualified person that would receive it, store it, prescribe it, and dispense it. We don't have that going on at this point. Um, so the only thing that we would need is for the logistics chief or the person submitting the request to sign the 213. And then we would also need them to enter a fund code in block 17. Um, that would be entered by the, fi um, the finance um, chief. And then finance will also sign on block 18. So 14 is logs chief and 17 and 18 is the finance chief. If you're not in an incident command, it will be the person who's submitting the request. And you don't have to worry about a fund code, so you can leave that blank. Then once we receive that 213, the last portion of that is for the NBS. This will vary who signs it depending on what is being requested. If it's a routine request, like some masks or most of the items that we have in the stockpile, I will sign it. If it is a request maybe for somebody is maybe doing TB testing and need equipment, um, then my director would sign it. Or it could, all, it, or it could also be um, signed by even um, higher senior leadership at, that, at, at this point. Okay, so are there any questions on the ICS 213R that we did for COVID? Okay. I think you can go ahead, Lisa. Okay, thank you. All right, so the next one I'm going to um, present is just a version of what it looks like when we receive it through EMERS. Um, so when it comes in, when a request comes through EMERS, um, it comes in a totally different way, but we're able to transmit the EMERS request into a ICS 213RR form to forward down to our warehouse staff for processing. So this is what the EMERS request would look like. You can see it's very much the same as um, the way that um, it is for the one we just looked at previously. It's just that it's already, it's already populated from the log person who submitted it with their view or their access in the front end. So the, the items will basically have the same information that was in the first one um, that I showed you, but I just wanted you to see that it looks a little bit different um, when it comes in through, through EMERS. Now EMERS is is a lot easier to track um, the and process and work 213 forms because they, they come in their sub, sub, subsequent numbers. So it automatically populates in block three the resource request number. So you don't have to come up with a number. It assigns one to it. 
And um, when you're working that mailbox, you, you're, you're updating it. It's all in real time. So you always know where you left off. Um, and in, in the MVS mailbox, when we're working manually, if there's more than one person working that box, we all have the same mailbox, but we all are working in it, and our view is different. So we require a lot of communication back and forth to make sure that we're not double processing um, requests. It's better just to let one person work the, the mailbox, and then it's a lot simplified. Okay. So that was just to show you a version of uh, EMERS request. Okay, now I want to try to walk through a swine response request um, so that you can see the types of items and information that they put in their request. So we received one here, the Indiana 2019 coronavirus disease. That was their incident name. This was received on May 11, 2020 at 1037 Eastern Time. The incident, um, the, the resource number was IN for Indiana to 00001. And these are the items that they ordered. They ordered um, a quantity of four captive pulp dispatch 25 caliber. They described in detail in, in the detailed item description box of what they were expecting to receive. And they also provided the, the date that they requested, which was 519. So they submitted their order on May the 11th that they're saying they need it by 519. They also submitted for cash captive, um, cash cartridges, both orange and blue. They stated how many they needed and the date for those. They provided their shipping address in block five, the name of the person submitting, the email and phone. They did not have any, any offloading or delivery issues, so they put non-applicable and then they put their name of secondary point of contact um, in this form. They also provided the first shift of who that point of contact would be um, for receiving the shipment. And then on the next document, they signed it, but you would have to enter a fund code, digitally signed by your finance, and then of course the NBS receives this. Now, this particular shipment is a little bit different than how we would handle a mass shipment. Um, so the first thing is, is that the captive bolts themselves can be shipped um, on, you know, in the regular shipment mode, but the cartridges are a hazmat item, and they required hazmat certification documentation to be provided to the carrier so that they can transport those. Hazmat items require ground shipping, and um, so we normally say based upon the location, it could take three business days to receive that. So when you go back and look at the date that this was submitted, on May the 11th, the submitter already knew that they were going to have some hazmat items shipped, so they put in a, a requested time that would allow for that shipment to arrive. Okay, so what happens after you submit your 213 form to request your supplies or equipment? The MVS reviews the ICS 213 and we forward it to our warehouse supply technicians. The supply technicians will check the inventory record for availability and, and we do always, if there is an item not available, I'm notified immediately so that I can notify the log chief or the person who's receiving it that that item is not available and they may need to initiate a local procurement action in order to get the item because they still have a need for it. Um, it's just that we maybe don't have it. So they still need to go out and find that item for, for, what, for their response. Um, so we give them that immediate notification so that they're aware they're not going to be receiving that item from the stockpile. So the supply technician will release that available inventory that was on that 213, and that pick ticket will be generated. That pick ticket will go back to the 
um, material handlers that are working out of picking and packing and, you know, boxing and shipping these items. And that's what they would do. They would pick it, they would pack it, get it boxed, labeled. Um, and then once they're done with that, they will, they are the ones that will provide us the tracking number of the um, shipment. They will return that information back to the NVS. To me, um, back to the NVS, we have a mailbox group. They'll turn it back to the NVS as well as to myself. Um, we will provide the IMT logistics chief or the person who submitted the request, the shipment information. We'll provide them the mode of shipment, tracking information, if it's a bill of lading for the hazardous item or if it's a heavy shipment, um, it will be going on, it will be going ground, so they will get a bill of lading. If it's going air, they will, it will be going UPS, so they'll get a UPS tracking number, and then we'll let them know what their delivery date and time, which will be obvious in the in the tracking information because it'll tell you that it's being delivered the next day by closed business. Then um, another thing um, that we do for the EMER side is, is when we have to provide the tracking information and if all of this information we have to log into EMERS and we have to upload that into EMERS. So we'll put the tracking number, the date that it's shipped, you know, sometimes even the weight you know, we will put the transportation costs only um, and the delivery dates of those items, and we will process that as shipped. And then that view is, is no longer available for us to edit. It goes back to the orderer for them to complete the request and close it out when they receive the item. Now, one thing extra that we do is in the, in the soft pile, especially at the warehouses, is that our supply technicians, they enter all 213 details in a response spreadsheet. That is something that we've used for internal use. Um, ever since 2015, we decided we wanted to capture all response data in a spreadsheet for every type of response. Um, and um, it includes all the details of the order, including the inventory costs and transportation costs. A lot of times this information is used for other purposes, modeling, um, I believe maybe the IMAT um, wanted to use that information for information gathering. So it's available for people if they're doing some type of project and they need data. Okay, so that um, basically covers the ICS 213 ordering process. Are there any questions? Lisa, we have some questions in the chat, but we'll take them at the end of the presentation. Okay, all righty. So now we'll move on to ordering 3D response support services using a statement of work. So 3D response support services are basically contractors that can provide depopulation, disposal, and decontamination services to support the incident command. These contract companies are available through USDA contracts. They're trained and sufficient contractors that can be mobilized with NVS equipment and or their own equipment. So sometimes we will mobilize contractors with our foam units or our poultry trailers or our whole house trailers, but the incident command may have a requirement for porta johns or um, front end loaders or those type of items. So those contractors have contracts to get those type of items if, if we need them for the response. And then, of course, the NBS will act as a single point of contact to the states and the incident command to select the best qualified contractors to support their depopulation, disposal, and decontamination efforts. So basically, in order to um, um, get, give us information needed in order for us to provide you those services you need, um, a statement of work is required. So this chart basically depicts what documents are required. You're going to need your statement of work form, which I have a picture in there, and you're also still going to need that NVS catalog because our equipment is listed inside of the catalog as well, what is available for whichever 
depopulation, maybe you might need something for decontamination for whatever your response need is. So information required to complete a statement of work for 3D responses support services are similar to the ones for the ICS form, but these are maybe a little bit more different, so we're going to go through it. Who prepares the statement of work? In an incident, man, in an incident command, it should be the ops chief that prepares the statement of work. Um, but sometimes the logistics chief will prepare that, but mainly the ops operations um, would prepare it. They would need to know the situation and why 3D response support services are needed. They would need to know the type of support required. What are we doing? We're going to do depopulation? Are we doing just decontamination? Are we doing disposal? Are we doing all three or a combination of one or two of those? So that's what they need to know. What do they need to complete their mission? Um, what tasks do we need the, the contractors to perform? So if we need them to do depopulation, that would be one task, which would be a line item for us. Um, but then let's say they say, you know what, we, we already know that um, we're going to do depopulation, but we might need some help with disposal. We don't want them to take them to the landfill, but we want some disposal help. Well, once depopulation it has occurred and any movement of any bird, animal, after that is considered a disposal process, so we would need to know that because that would be a different line item on the contract. So know what services that you, you need before um, you submit the request, um, the task that you need performed. Of course, the funding sources for the 3D response support services, if it's an incident, um, if, if an incident command is set up, they have a, they have a fund code for that response. And then any additional information to help explain the requirements to support the request we ask to provide. And where do that SOW, where is that SOW submitted? It's submitted to the NBS mailbox. So this is um, basically a version of one that was filled out. Um, I have blackened out some things on here so as to not reveal any premise and, and um, you know, PII. Um, so basically, this one was for California VND. They had a request for NBS to support a whole house CO2 for 10 commercial houses of cage-free layers in California. They stated that the whole house method was the most efficient of depopulating these houses. So block number two, they requested depopulation. They did not request any disposal or decontamination or, or any other items other than depopulation on this request. So they gave a little bit more details in block um, in line number three, which we asked them to provide the detail of the tasks to be performed by the 3D contractors. So the number of labor hours per day may be determined for each task to be completed. So those are their billable hours. So we wanted to know geographical location, number of premises, specific job tasks, and um, specific job tasks, um, number of personnel needed if known, and special needs, any specialized equi equipment if they needed to be certified or SCBA qualified, of course, for this one they would be. And then, um, and then you know, we would, um, of course, any type of equipment that you need, animal handling, foam, CO2. In this case, it was the whole house. So they provided their detailed information, premise ID, they provided the address. They told us it was one premise with 10 houses of cage free layer um, birds, approximately 90,000. Whole house gas was estimated um, for three days during three 10 hour days. They needed a nine person team um, with four of those people being SCBA certified. So that's the confined space clearance. Um, so they need those in order to clear that space. Um, and then they need, the contractors were required for staging, sealing poultry houses, setting up CO2 manifolds, C and D whole house, whole house equipment and trailer, and they also requested one whole house CO2 trailer that contained the supplies and equipment to include gas monitors and, and they asked for radios. 
So the whole house CO2 trailers already have those supplies that are needed inside. And if you notice, they have mentioned in line five, C and D. Well, the contractors wouldn't have needed a, dispose, a, a decontamination checkbox on number two because they always have to C and D our equipment on and off themselves. So that's why they're C and D listed here, but you don't see decontamination selected on block two. So moving on to block number, line number four, they told us what program funds were going to be supporting that. And then um, number five, they provided additional information, request VS incident personnel to pick up the whole house trailer and transport it down to the response as soon as possible. So what they were saying is, while you're mobilizing your contractors to the response, since the whole house was centrally located near the incident, um, and near the incident command at another staging area, they requested that they be able to transport it to the response location, which we authorized. And so that basically would complete the questions, those five questions that we need from that statement of work in order to mobilize these here 3D response services. So what happens next? Utilizing the information in the statement of work provided, we will rewrite the statement of work. It's more detailed. Um, it requires a lot of policy documentation, biosecurity rules, and all types of other, um, you know, OSHA guidelines and things of that nature. Um, we will send it to the contractor for an estimate, which is for the logistics chief for the National Veterinary Stockpile, it's market research. But the contracting officer has to uh, request the quote. And that's the official cost that um, we will use to write the contract um, to mobilize the contractors. So the contractors prepare that quote that we requested um, based off the requirements that we sent them in our SOW because we pulled in everything that the ops chief sent us into one SOW and we send that estimate. They, they will do that quote and they will send that to the MDS log chief. And um, also, they will well, they'll send the estimate to the logistics chief and the quote to the contracting officer. Once the contracting officer accepts that quote, then the MBS submits a request. And um, I got to fix that. We got spurs there with FIOPS, um, but um, to, to the admin service center to create a funded requisition in IAS. In that requisition, we will attach a requisition form that's required by I'm contracting to be filled out, one page form, the contract, the statement of work that we, we, that we rewrote, and the contractor quote. We'll submit that um, all in that request for that IAS funded requisition. Um, the requisition will also contain the line items that are required. In this case, we said we only had one line item, and that was for depopulation. But we would still have other line items. We would have a mobilization line item, a depopulation line item, and then a demobilization line item. And then with that requisition is submitted and, and approved. Once that has been completed, it becomes a contract administration work now. So the contracting officer will issue an order against that contract, our existing contract that we have, and he'll submit it to the contractor for signature and return. The contracting officer additionally is issuing a core letter to be assigned to a core, to assign a core. The core is provided, the core letter, the contract and the order which includes the statement of work, the contractor roster that lists all personnel mobilized by name and role. The MDS will provide the names of the contractors mobilized to the contact at the incident command. It could be the logs chief, ops chief, and the resource specialist. The contractors are then mobilized to the response location with the equipment requested, and upon arrival, the contractor reports to the incident command to be checked into the response and issue the badge if applicable. The IMT finance chief, ops chief, and resource specialist receives a copy of that contract. That contract is uploaded in EMERS. Sometimes I submit that contract directly to EMERS and it's updated by EMERS staff 
and sometimes I'll go out there and upload it myself. I prefer to have EMER staff upload it in, in EMER so that I know that it's appropriately loaded in the correct portion of EMER. And once contractors' act activities are completed and the incident command requests that the contractors be demobilized, a, demobil a demobilization order is issued to the contractor, and this will include demobilization of all MBS equipment that, or, or, or any equipment that the contractor provided and contract personnel. And that concludes my briefing. Are there any questions at this point? We do have I a question um, yes, in the chat queue. Who determines how much or what items are available for stockpiling? Okay, I'm, I'm, I think I may ask, um, I think I may understand what it is um, you're asking. What items we have in the stockpile, who determines those? Well, based on our H HSCD-9, to support animal disease outbreaks, we know that there are items that are required, such as PPE, emergency push pack items, um, any of the vaccine supplies. So those are items that we need to uh, mobilize to a response. How much we need is based all on demand and demand analysis and forecasting. So we've had outbreaks since 2015. So based on the data that we collect um, for each response, we're able to model that data to see how much of PPE is, 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 was used, was utilized, what sizes, you know, the types of items that were the most um, demanded. And based on demand, when we forecast every year our PPE orders, we forecast based on demand and usage. So that's how we determine how much to keep in the stockpile. And, um, the, and the methodology for that works perfectly um, because um, we, we were, we're stocking in years, so we have shelf life for five years. So every year we're utilizing during the response current shelf life, and then, and then we still have four years, but every year we're ordering so that we keep our shelf life um, stable. Um, so that is how we determine how much of the items that we need to stockpile to make sure that we can meet the needs of the stockpile. And we are a stockpile, so we have to stop based on uh, 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 animal disease outbreaks, such as 2015, um, of, you know, epic proportions where you want to utilize a lot of that item that you must have and you don't run out of. So I'm happy to say we have never had any stockpile item ever rent out during a response um, for a critical um, need. And it says, who makes sure that the items are restocked? Well, we do acquisitions all, every year, all year. We're funded to, um, you know, provide um, to restock or replenish our supplies every year. So every year we do acquisitions for the items that are stored in the stockpile. Um, sometimes there's acquisitions that we don't need to stock based on demand. So those items we don't stock because we still have sufficient quantities. Um, but the items that are the greatly demanded items that um, that we have to maintain levels on, we, we do restock those on an annual. So PPE is an example. So your your um, your coveralls, your boots, gloves, respirators, tape, those types of items are every year ordered. Um, and then there's some items that we don't we don't get much request for. So there's no point in buying something that we have plenty in stock and we don't have a need for it. So that's how we determine what gets stopped and in the timely manner that it does. Great. Um, right now we don't have any other questions in the chat. Do we have any verbal questions in the queue? Yes, we have uh, one question in the queue. Call your line is unmuted. Please go ahead. Caller, please go ahead and ask your question. Your line is unmuted. Please unmute the phone from your end. No 
Okay. So okay. let's go ahead and take another chat question. Um, you mentioned that hazmat items are shipped via ground transport. How do you ship to overseas states or territories? Okay, we, um, so we haven't had a response from the NVS perspective where we've had to ship um, um, overseas or to territories. We have had exercises where we have shipped, you know, push packs and things of like that that are non-hazmat items that we have used for training and exercise purposes. Um, so if, if it wasn't hazmat item that is needed for a response, the, the first thing that would probably be required is, is that something that you're able to get in that particular um, overseas location? And when you say overseas, I really don't know um, what you mean by overseas location, but um, you would probably want to obtain those items locally. Um, if it is, um, if it is something that has to go overseas and it can't go air, then it would have to go by water or to like maybe like if you're talking Puerto Rico or you're talking, you know, one of the um, other, other territories, that would be how it would ship. But we have not had an incident ever where we've had to ship any hazmat items to um, in, in, outside of the United States. Next question. Where is the NBS catalog online? Um, if you would like to have a copy of the catalog, you can email the NBS at USDA.gov and um, that they will um, provide that information um, to you. It's on a restricted site, so you would have to have access to that site. So I recommend that you just email the um, NBS at USDA.gov to get a copy of that. And what happens to your supplies in your stockpile that expire or are near expiration? Okay, so we, we ship based on um, shelf life. We have to rotate supplies. So we're shipping the, you know, first in, first out. So the first items that came in are the first ones that's out because they will, re re they will expire before ones that can come in later. Once we get to the nearing of the expiration, we try to consume them. So if there is an outbreak going on and there's a, um, maybe let's say 90 days, 120 days left on the shelf life, well, we know that if there's an active response going on, we, we can consume those items before they expire. Now, if we get to it when it does expire, the next, the next thing that we do is we have a professional development staff inventory that we use to train all the VMOs. There's a, lots of training that's done across the agency where they need, um, you know, PPE and things of that nature. So we will put those items in their location. The MBS also does drills and training and exercises, and we use that as that 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 professional development. We call it a professional development staff inventory for those. Um, I can fortunately say this. We have never um, had to dispose of any PPE or supplies since I've been here. I don't think we've ever done a disposal action on any, any of our countermeasures. Um, we have put some items out on GSA excess, but th those items were from E&D back in the day. Um, and um, they, you know, we kept them in the warehouse for so many years, and then we um, we excess them so on GSA. So that's basically how we rotate stock. We we try to use our excess PPE that's expired to train our own people with, um, so that we don't have to use the good product. Um, and then, of course, um, like I said, um, NBS does. Um, training and exercises and drills, and we will consume some of those items during those times. Hope that answers your question. Next. Uh, do we have any other questions in the verbal queue? We don't have any questions on the phone line. As a reminder, please press pound 2 on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. OK, 
Okay, and I see no other questions in the chat. So, on behalf of the National, go ahead. Okay, I think we're going to conclude since we have no other questions. Um, on behalf of the National Training and Exercise Program, I'd like to thank Lisa for presenting today. And thanks to everyone who attended the webinar. Um, please be sure to watch your emails for our continued webinar series. We have some coming up in the beginning of August, beginning of September. Um, and remember, if you have any ideas for webinars that, you know, we can explore for our emergency preparedness community, please feel free to contact us. You can find recorded webinars on various topics on the PEP video gallery online at USDA APIS website. And with that, I wish you all to have a great afternoon.